boy, the alcohol fumes sure are strong in here. It's the infamous, wonderful, not to mention stunning, gold dagger of Amon-Ra. Unlike the gift shop daggers, this one does not have Made in Pittsburgh stamped into the blade. This is the Mammalogy Laboratory. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be a Mammalogy Lab? Well, now you know how it feels. Your most thorough scrutiny reveals only some dust on the lens of the magnifying glass. It's Olympia's ferret, Daisy. Daisy will furiously flash across the floor on fleet ferret feet if you try to catch her. It looks like a ferret. Stacks of dusty boxes litter the floor. These boxes contain nothing of interest. A careful inspection of the boxes reveals nothing out of the ordinary. The crate is stenciled wild dingoes. You hate to think of how many wild dingoes are stacked up in that crate. Lugging the contents of this crate around with you would only hinder your investigation. Seems to be nothing more than a solidly built crate. There's an old cabinet on the wall, decorated only by a few cobwebs and a layer of dust. The cabinet is empty. All the equipment is out on the work desk. A detailed visual inspection of the cabinetry reveals nothing untoward. Shelves line the walls of the lab. Best to leave them alone. You wouldn't want one of them tumbling down upon you and crushing the life out of you. Under close scrutiny, you find that the shelves are... simply shelves. The poster outlines basic dissection and preservation techniques. You scan it quickly, just in case you decide to make a change in your career. Don't take it with you. It'll always be here for your reference. No hidden messages or clues are revealed by your thorough examination of the dissection poster. It's a cold storage locker, basically a heavy-duty icebox for preserving specimens and domestic snacks. The surface of the meat locker is none too clean, with a few indeterminate smears and encrusted substances, but nothing readily identifiable. It's the door to the Mammalogy Lab's cold storage locker. Aside from the usual dings, dents, and bits of rusty flaking chrome, there are no unusual details to be found on the locker door. A slab of meat which smells ripe. Veins of rancid fat forming abscesses that ooze copious amounts of pus run through the decomposed cut of beef. Yum, just like mom used to make. You pick it up and place it in your purse. It's a sack of plaster, sometimes used for making molds. You have no use for a sack of plaster. It's too high up for you to examine with a magnifying glass, but fortunately there's nothing telltale on the sack of plaster. The word gorilla has been stenciled across the label of this large crate. Somebody's crossed out gorilla and scrawled Sasquatch underneath. Curator humor. It's nailed shut. Besides, you have no desire to confront the contents. 
Under close inspection you find several gorilla hairs protruding from the thin cracks between the slats. Not much of a packing job, but nor is there anything suspicious about this. The word wildebeest is stenciled on the crate's label. You're not quite curious enough to open up the crate and see what a wildebeest looks like. This crate is sealed, but you're not missing anything. The contents are unpleasant and hardly useful. Going over the crate inch by inch with a magnifying glass, you fail to find anything of significance. The word hippo has been stenciled on this crate's label, but somehow you find it difficult to believe that there's a whole hippo in this box. The crate is nailed shut, which is just as well since you have little use for selected hippo portions. You examine the crate carefully, but discover nothing of importance. There's an odd assortment of tools hung on the wall. Some of the more hideous-looking implements are probably used for the practice of taxidermy. None of them appear particularly useful to you. The tools are meant for esoteric activities such as gutting thickly furred mammals. Therefore you have no use for them. You examine the tools closely for such giveaways as bone fragments or clumps of human hair, blood or skin. To your relief you find nothing. An empty canister stands in the corner, offering no clue as to what it once contained. The canister is clearly empty and too heavy to be moved around. Even under a magnifying glass, the label proves too worn and faded to reveal the former contents of the canister. The light casts a sickly clinical glow over the cluttered lab. The light is too inconveniently situated for you to take. Don't do that. You could burn out your retinas. The shelf is crammed with mammalogy equipment. You can neither move nor remove the shelf. You examine the shelf minutely, but you see nothing out of the ordinary. There's an array of lab equipment scattered around the top of the table. None of the equipment appears useful to you in your present investigation. Even under the magnifying glass, there is no evidence of anything unusual on or around the desk. A full bottle of Dr. Moribund's guaranteed snake oil. The label reads, Guaranteed to ward off poisonous snakes, or your money back. The directions read, Sprinkle copious amounts of Dr. Moribund's guaranteed snake oil on snake. Snake will leave you alone. If snake does not leave you alone, Dr. Moribund accepts no legal responsibility for damage occurring to the snake's victim. Death is a natural part of life, so when your time comes, it's best to accept it and go out gracefully. You pick it up and place it in your purse. The trunk has a name tag identifying it as part of Carrington's personal luggage. Beside it is another sticker emblazoned with the logo, Andrea Doria. This trunk is locked. You find plenty of scratches, dents and gouges, but nothing unusual for a steamer trunk. A skeleton lies in the trunk, its bones picked clean by the domestic beetles. They've efficiently removed every last shred of flesh, making the skeleton nearly impossible to identify. You have no reason, or the slightest desire, to touch this skeleton.
It appears to be a gold pocket watch. A close look reveals an inscription on the watch. To Dr. Archibald Carrington III for your years of dedicated service, many thanks from your staff at the British Museum. You pick it up and place it in your purse. It's the door leading back to the alcohol preservation lab. Am I going to have to spank you? Am Spray? Maybe she's wanting to join us, yes? It looks like meat being carried by bugs. You're a vegetarian. You don't want the meat anymore. It's too far away for you to get a good look at it, but it's definitely cheese and it definitely stinks. It's a length of wire. It's a Thompson submachine gun, also known as a Tommy gun. The fine powder on the gun indicates that it has recently been fired. The trap is disarmed now, so it's perfectly safe. Quit fooling around with it. You pick it up and place it in your purse. A closer look reveals a bit of mold on the cheese. the dagger. Such a great loss to my country. First to have it stolen from the temple, then from Egypt, and now this. When will it end? When will it return to its rightful place? Nice pocket watch. Does it look familiar? It looks like all the other gold pocket watches I've ever seen. You don't see anything special about it? No. Snake 
charmers sometimes use the oil to control their snakes. I've heard that cobras enjoy a good massage with snake oil, but uh, I've never tried it myself. Beastly substance. Ah! I beg your pardon, Countess. Here now, where did you get your mitts on that? Answer me. I, I, I. <clears throat> I really don't think that belongs to you, Miss Bow. I suggest you give it to me for safekeeping. No, I don't believe I can do that, Countess. Miss Bow, I said... Oh, I suppose you're right. <laughs> Are you always this upset by pocket watches, Countess? Why, yes, dear girl. I've always had a dreadful fear of them. <laughs> I'm simply devastated that it was stolen before I got a chance to see it. It's supposed to be simply divine. Your facial scars are so wonderful. How did you keep them? Fencing, my Strudel. As a young man, I would dance with my Heidelberg friends. We would stop our opponent's saber just before it went through our faces, which would make the scars you see now. Ah, that is very interesting. You did not use masks to protect your faces? Nine. That would have been considered unmanly. Hmm, you'll have to show me how to do that sometime. There are many things I can show you, my strudel. Perhaps we should go somewhere less public, Wolfie. Oh yeah, good idea. Particularly since there's an annoying reporter wandering around the museum. That is not something I would have allowed if I was running things here. Give it time, Wolfie. Perhaps you will be running things here someday, if I have anything to say about it. Oh? What can you do? There are ways, but come, let us speak of these things in more privacy. plate on the armor is slightly open, as if something is protruding from the inside of the dark helm. Your close scrutiny reveals that there is indeed a body within the cramped confines of the suit of armor. Dr. Pippin Carter, famous dead archaeologist. Dr. Carter's skin is cold and disgusting to the touch. He definitely gives the appearance of being dead. Dr. Carter's body has been indelicately crammed into the suit of armor. His filmy eyes gaze in mute shock. His head is bent at an unlikely angle and the skin is puckered where the helmet's edges bite into the expanding flesh.
The long curved tusks of the mastodon are currently supporting the limp weight of Ernie Leach, ex-maintenance engineer. The tusks are hard and smooth like ivory. The tusks are slightly dampened in the areas where the body has come in contact with them, otherwise you find nothing unusual about them. From here you can see the mastodon's molars. It's cold, hard and rough. The molars seem to be well affixed. The mastodon skull appears as normal as a prehistoric skeleton can be. The teeth show no evidence of cavities or other orthodontic disorders. A rigid metallic frame supports the giant tusks and, at the moment, Ernie's lifeless body. The metallic supports are cold and rigid. A bit of dust comes off onto your fingers. You shake your hand gently to dislodge it. The support structure, like a professional wrestler, appears very strong and totally clueless. Ernie's head lolls back limply. Ernie's head is slightly resistant to your efforts. Rigor mortis has apparently begun to set in. You examine Ernie's head carefully, searching for contusions, bruises or other evidence of foul play. You see little, but you do notice a faint odor, not immediately identifiable. Ernie's eyes are bulging in a peculiar way leading you to believe he either choked, drowned, or was frightened to death. You consider doing the traditional thing and closing Ernie's eyes, but decide that perhaps it's better not to tamper with his body, which, though this may seem cold, is evidence of murder. You look closely at Ernie's eyes, but find little except a few broken blood vessels. Ernie's ears appear normal. You touch Ernie's ear. It feels eerie. You inspect Ernie's ears closely and find nothing except the usual earwax. Ernie's mouth gapes, though whether this occurred in his death throes or simply as a result of the corpse's position is unclear. You gingerly place your fingers into Ernie's mouth. Cold and clammy hardly begins to describe the feeling. There's a sickening squishing sound as you probe the moist tissues. There is little to see in Ernie's mouth besides the usual teeth, tongue, hard and soft palates and uvula. But there does seem to be an unusual amount of mucosa foam in the cheeks and throat, usually indicative of death by drowning. There's also a strange trickle of clear fluid. With obvious distaste, you sniff around the area of his mouth. The odor is one of pure alcohol. Annie's neck is stretched backwards, tilting his head back at an extreme angle. touch Ernie's neck, inspecting for anything unusual. You find nothing. You look carefully for bruises or contusions around the neck, but you find nothing. This arm is flung out to the side as if to say, I am completely limp. Ernie's right arm is stiffening in its outstretched position. Despite your closest examination, you find nothing unusual about Ernie's outstretched right arm. Ernie's arm is draped over a tusk in a casual pose. If he weren't dead, he'd look like an ad for menswear. Due to rigor mortis, Ernie's left arm is slightly stiff. Hence the expression stiff, referring to a corpse. A minute inspection of Ernie's left arm reveals 
nothing suspicious. Danny's suspenders are intact, which saves you from much embarrassment. The heavy twilled fabric of the suspenders is rough and stretched taut over Ernie's unmoving chest. The fabric also feels slightly moist. The suspenders are damp but intact and reek of alcohol or something similarly chemical. Dry cleaning fluid perhaps. The fabric of the shirt appears to be clinging somewhat to Ernie's chest. Ernie's shirt feels cold and moist. These are animal hairs of some sort, too coarse to be human. The hairs are bristled and clearly animal in origin, with a faint smell of alcohol. You pick it up and place it in your purse. appear to be clinging somewhat to his legs. The pants feel dank and wet, but the moisture evaporates quickly from your fingers. The pants are intact, but the smell emanating from them is noticeable. It's as if he took a swim in bathtub gin. Ernie's shoes are intact, yet strangely dark and damp looking. You press on one of Ernie's shoes and see a bit of moisture oozing from the dark spongy leather. As soon as you remove your finger, the moisture immediately seeps back into the leather. The leather of Ernie's shoes are soaked through and through. The scent is an overpowering mixture of sweat, shoe polish and alcohol. It's unfortunate that Ernie died, but his body is nicely displayed on that mastodon, don't you think? Makes quite a nice exhibit, actually. I'm sure I have no idea who could have killed him. Then you deny any involvement in his death? I'm not denying anything, my dear. The man was a common worker, don't you know? I'd have no reason to have any contact with him at all. Animal hairs? Really? Ach, you are smelling like the brewery, mein Kapitan. Either you've been drinking, or you've been eating too many of those grapes. Sure, and Bigora. A man needs a little nip from his flask now and then, doesn't he? Personally, I do not require the drinking of the alcohol. It would impair my mental and physical skills. Ernie Leach has been murdered! What was that, lass? Ernie is dead! So, you've finally come to us to confess, is that it? Confess? No! I'm reporting a murder! And you was the first one to find the body again? Well, I guess so. Quite a coincidence, Fraulein. I think we should be interrogating you to learn the truth! I've had enough of your lies! Calm down, Heimlich. If there's any interrogating to be done, I'll be the one who does it. Now then, lass, where did you find the body? The Mastodon room. He's hanging from some Mastodon tusks. Ah, he's probably just sleeping on the job. No, I'm sure he's dead. Well, I'll go take a look at him then. If I need to talk to you, I'll find you later. Who 
You're doing a fine job, Laura. My Ermi, he was a wonderful man. I really loved him. Oh, sure you did. I know your type, vet. I know you didn't really love him. But I did. Ernie was the first man I've ever really loved. I was even trying to find work for him so he could make the extra money. Why did he need extra money? He had a good job here, didn't he? It was the gambling. The ice pick. He killed my Ernie for the gambling debts. Ernie wasn't killed with an ice pick. No, no, the ice pick is the... How do you say it? The lone fish. Lone fish? Oh, you mean ice pick is the name of a lone shark? We, oui, the ice pick is an evil man. You're sure he's the one who killed Ernie? My Ernie, he was worried about the ice pick. He told me about him this evening. Hmm, very curious. I'm surprised you had time to see Ernie tonight. Why is that? Because you've been spending so much time with Mr. Dorian. Oh, you mean the Steve? He's the attractive man, but we are only the friends, no? But my Ernie, what will I do without him? I can see you're upset. I'll leave you alone. Steve. They were very, very nice. Haven't seen you in a while, Mr. Dorian. Well, women keep carrying me off. Carrying you off? Yeah. First, Miss Delacroix pulled me away from the party to show me the old master's gallery. Then there was Dr. Miklos. She's been pestering me about my scars ever since she found out I worked on the docks. Weird lady. You don't seem too upset by all the attention. Well, I would rather have spent the time with you. I think a big, strong man like you would have been able to get away from them if you wanted to do so. Well, I hate to be rude, and I did end up finding you here. Have you heard about the murders? Uh, murders? Oh, I, I guess somebody did mention that. You seem kind of distracted. Yeah, well, I've got news for you, too. I think some of the paintings in the old master's gallery are forgeries. The paint is still wet on some of them. Yes, well, I hardly think that... Steve, a terrible thing has happened. Ernie is dead. Ernie? Yes, my Ernie. What will I do? Oh, I need a big man to cry on. Please, come into my office. Sorry, Miss Bo. The poor woman seems very upset. Maybe there's something I can do for her. I can just guess what that is. We can talk more later, okay? We'll see about that. Hmm. You hear muffled voices coming through the door to Yvette's office. Ooh la la. How does that feel? It is magnifique. Mmm. I'm not rubbing too hard, am I? The harder the better, mon ami. Well, we all get a little stiff now and then. Ooh, and you are so good at working out the kinks. Mmm. Uh, 
Would you mind not moaning so loud? You might draw attention. Oh, I cannot be helping it. You are so big and so strong. Mm. Oh my. Bleu. I can explain this. I bet you can, Mr. Dorian. I'm just rubbing her neck. Oui, and he does it so well. I'll just leave you two alone. Miss Bo, wait. This is not the public part of the museum. This area is very important to you and all of your kind. Leave now before you force me to shoot you. Actor, my body is completely important to you. Need to finger poking. Has 1926 been a good year for you, Mr. Hamlick? Why do you want to know, Fraulein Bo? Well, mm, I'm just curious, I guess. You know what they say, curiosity disembowels a cat. I don't think that's exactly what they say, Mr. Hamlick. Mr. Heimlich, how do you suppose the thieves got past you? Wasn't the dagger supposed to be heavily guarded? Of course it was guarded! I have no idea how they got the dagger. They must have drugged me. They must have hypnotized me. They must have been ghost. Mr. Heimlich, are you all right? That must be it. They were ghosts. I couldn't have possibly missed them. I couldn't have. I couldn't have! Mr. Hamlick? Oh, Mutter, I'm sorry I let you down. I'm sorry they got your paintings. Please, try to paint again, wherever you are. Please. I'm sorry if I upset you. My Mutter, she was so heartbroken when her paintings were stolen from the museum in Germany. It was her first exhibition. She was so happy until... Mm, perhaps we should change the subject. Subject? What subject? What are you talking about, you silly girl? Oh, never mind. Do you know anything about Egyptology, Mr. Hamlick? Only that I am sworn to protect everything in this museum. And I intend to do that, so don't get any funny ideas! That is Egyptian writing. If you want to know what it says, talk to Dr. Miklos. I do not read the news. Nothing outside this museum concerns me. I live, breathe, eat and sleep to defend this museum. It is my father and my child. I love it. Do not touch the exhibits! The police are useless. I will find the dagger myself. I have my washing done at the German laundry on 39th Street. I enjoy strolling the docks at night, Miss Bo. 
I like to practice headlocks on the local thugs when they try to mug me. I do not indulge in such ridiculous things. I have better things to do than sit and drink the alcohol, which taints the bodily fluids. I do not know him. My whole world is this museum, Miss Bo. I do not indulge in nasty French pastries, Miss Bo. They are bad for my figure. A military man must maintain his stamina through proper exercise on diet. He is the man who does my laundry when the German laundry is closed. Of course, the German laundry is never closed, since it is manned by sturdy German laundry people who need no sleep. I do not know your father, but I'm sure my father could beat your soft American father in a duel. That irritating little civilian is better off kaput. He reminded me of a small, yappy dog, always trailing after the good Dr. Carrington. His name sounded German, but I think he was the imposter. I never trusted him. And he was probably an art thief anyway. He did not care for the museum. He wished he could keep his finds, but they belong to the line decker. And we intend to keep them. Do you understand me? He is a good man. He lets me do my job. I just hope he lets me take care of the filthy artists when they are finally discovered. They will wish they had never been born! Dr. Carrington is doing all he can about the theft, then? Of course he is! Just wait until I get my hands on them! I have the chance to perform my Heimlich death maneuver once more, if I'm lucky! <laughs> is a bumbling fool who does not care about this museum. I do not need his help. I do not need anyone's help, least of all yours. Dr. Miklos is a fine woman. She is truly dedicated to the security of the Lion Decker. Fraulein Delacroix is a charming young lady. She loves the museum, but she is a work of art herself. I admire women who take good care of their bodies as we military men do. That is me, Bill Heimlich. Do you know how I got these scars on my face, Miss Bo? No. The little ones my father gave me, teaching me to do with the saber. The big ones I got at Heidelberg, dueling with my friends. How I miss them. Your friend? You rub salt in the fresh cuts to make them heal with the bigger scar. Did you know that? Um, no, I didn't, Mr. Hamlet. That's fascinating. He works on the docks. He has red hair. He has no scars on his face. I do not trust him. I do not trust her. I do not trust you. I do not trust anyone. I do not trust him. I do not know why he's here. I think he is a Nazi. They are everywhere. He wanted the dagger all along. He probably stole it. I should kill him right now, but I have no evidence. Oh 
Ernie was a decent man. And then I find the murdering coward who drowned him. They will be crushed in my powerful hands. I do not know him, but if I did, I would practice my Heimlich death maneuver on him. Criminals should not be allowed to live. They could all be actives. I do not like you bandering around and writing things. You are perhaps taking notes on what you would most like to steal? Is that it? Fraulein Bo, you are far too nosy. Keep that class to yourself unless you wish to study my scars. I do not need a drink. I only drink water after it's been boiled. Charms, they are the tiny enemies, you know. They must protect our bodily fluids from the invaders. There are many bones in the museum, Miss Bo. Ask Dr. Miklos how they clean the flesh from them sometime. It is most fascinating. That is an Egyptian symbol, Miss Bo. Where did you see it? Have you been snooping around the museum? Have you? I do not care what that English Dummkampf has written on his little notepad. If he had a good German memory, he would remember everything. I know nothing of carbon paper, Miss Bo, nor do I want to. Why do you want to know about charcoal? Are you planning on burning down the museum? Well, are you? I do not care about this ridiculous man's criminal past. He isn't here. If he was, I would pop his heart out with my famous Heimlich death maneuver. I do not often consider such foolish things. Why do you want to know about wire cutters? Are you planning on stealing my pterodactyl? That looks like a snake lasso. Dr. Miklos could tell you for certain. I just use my hands to capture the snakes. They fear me, so they will not bite me. I know nothing about lanterns. I do not need one. I can see in the dark. Many of our exhibits are hung with fire. Did you know that you could garrote someone in a matter of moments with a bit of fire? Fallen Bo, keep your key to yourself. If it is a key to your room, you do not interest me. I know it does not fit into anything in this museum, and I won't have you sticking it anywhere you please. I do not need snake oil. I do not fear snakes. I do not fear anything. So snakes fear me. Where did you get that? That is a man's fudge. I do not think you are a man, Miss Bo. Are you? Did you steal the fudge? Answer me! Oh no, I didn't steal it. I swear. If I find out you did, you have had it, Fräulein Bo! I will not tolerate illegal acts in this museum! Uh, 
The dagger is a priceless work of art, and I will get it back. I will get it back, do you hear me? There are many hairy creatures in this museum, Miss Bo, and I would suggest that you not pull out their hair. I would throw you out now if I could, you nosy American female. We use cheese in our mousetraps around the museum. How I love to hear that snap, that squeak. Then I shoot them just to make sure they are kaput. I have my own supply. Thank you. I have no use for that. I do not need a butter glass. I have my own, danke. What am I supposed to do with that? I have plenty of hair. Give it to her already. I do not want it. What are you looking at? Stop scrutinizing me this instant! That smells most interesting, but I do not require protection from snakes. All snakes fear me. I do not need that. I see perfectly in the dark like the wolf I am named after. Lanterns are for the weak fools who wish to become targets in the darkness. I have no need for making the notes, Fraulein Bo. I have the perfect German memory. Where did you get that? That is not yours. You're an art thief, are you not? Confess! I do not want that. Give it to Dr. Miklos. Be careful with those. You might damage one of the exhibits. Never point a weapon at me, Fraulein Bo. Not even a toy like that. My highly trained reflexes could kill you in three seconds if I wanted to. Three seconds! And I am considering doing that right now! If this is some sort of bribe or nasty proposition, I am not interested! No thank you. I never eat when I'm on duty. Wolf is obnoxious, but try to control your violent impulses, Laura. This appears to be a large button on the wall. When you push the button, you hear a sliding noise off in the distance, clearly originating outside of this room.
The desk is in disarray, as if a struggle has occurred here recently. This is a crime scene, so it would be a bad idea to touch the desk surface and leave your fingerprints behind. Imagine trying to explain that to the police. It's on the floor, but it's actually a desk lamp. Since the floor is an odd location for a desk lamp, and since other desk items have been disturbed, you conclude that the lamp was knocked down during some sort of physical activity that took place on the desk. It looks like a shred of clothing fabric. You don't need it. Leave it here for the police. It looks like a piece of fabric torn from Yvette's dress. Possibly in a moment of passion. Red hairs. Feels like red hair. A close look seems to indicate that the red hairs belong to a human. It's a petite woman's shoe. The backs of the high heels on this expensive woman's shoe are heavily scuffed. You pick it up and place it in your purse. A nice, if somewhat worn, woman's leather shoe. A petite size 6. The heel is considered high for the 1920s, indicating that it's a custom-made shoe. The back of the heel is heavily scuffed. The subject of this sculpture looks curiously familiar. The odd statue feels like it's made of cheap, quick-drying plaster. The sculpture gives off a strong smell of fresh plaster. Yvette's face doesn't look as good in death as it did in life. Perhaps because her makeup is covered with plaster dust. Yvette's face feels stiff from rigor mortis. A bit of plaster dust comes off on your finger when you touch her cold skin. There is plaster in all of the openings on Yvette's face. Mouth, nostrils, eyes, ears. She has several scratches on her face, as well as cuts on her lips. Yvette's hair, formerly full of bounce and shine, is now lifeless and dull. It could use a thorough washing with a good shampoo to get all the plaster dust out of it. Yvette's formerly soft hair is now stiff, as a result of being plastered to her head. No split ends! There is plaster dust all over Yvette's bare, pale skin. Yvette's bare, plaster-dusted dead flesh feels stiff and cold. There are a few scratches on Yvette's skin, as if she was in a struggle before she died. Yvette's dress doesn't look as good as it did earlier in the evening. The fabric of the dress feels stiff from the plaster. Nice weave in the hardened fabric of the dress. 
The scarf around Yvette's neck looks suspiciously like the hosiery she was wearing on her legs earlier. The scarf around Yvette's neck feels silky where it's not covered with plaster. The scarf clearly isn't a scarf. It's the silk hosiery Yvette was wearing earlier in the evening. Her neck under the scarf shows red friction burns, as if she was strangled. This makes you wonder if she died during a passionate moment or had simply developed the habit of wearing silk hose around her neck. It's Yvette's left hand. Yvette's left hand is stiff and cold. Yvette's left hand is plastered. Red hair. Red hairs. Definitely red hairs. Probably human. You pick it up and place it in your purse. It appears to be a pair of bifocal glasses. It's a pair of bifocal glasses clutched tightly in her fist. There appears to be a fingerprint on one of the lenses of the bifocals, although you have no way to identify it. You pick it up and place it in your purse. Countess, why are you tied up on my desk? Your face has certainly changed to an attractive pale color, my dear. You seem a little under the weather. Are you okay? Oh dear, you don't look well at all. O'Reilly! You want Mr. O'Reilly? Okay, just wait right here and I'll go get him.